Well, welcome viewers, Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia, and I've decided to, as far as I can, rerun the Australian Royal Commission videos on the channel. Um, I just don't want people to forget what happened back there. Obviously, the Jehovah Witnesses are pretty ignorant of the Australian Royal Commission. Um, so I'm going to do everything I can to try and run these videos. It's going to be lengthy, but I want to open it with Barbara Anderson's Watchtower documents. Um, I'll put the link below. Um, the Australian Royal Commission by Bar Barbara Anderson. An Australian Royal Commission held formal public hearings to examine evidence about child sexual abuse within religious and charitable organisations in that country, in Australia, in my country. There are over 30 of these ongoing investigations involving a large number of religious religions and charities. Each public hearing examined a number of individual case studies involving different public and private organisations. Jehovah Witnesses were among the religious organisations being investigated. The Commission wanted to know specifically how Jehovah Witnesses and the Watchtower Society responded to allegations of child abuse involving members of their congregations. In 2015, the Royal Commission's public hearings involving Jehovah Witnesses were scheduled and heard in Sydney starting on Monday, July the 27th and continued through to August 14th, 2015. The intent of the hearings was to investigate the actual practices and policies of the Jehovah Witnesses and Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Australia Limited in situations of reported and suspected child abuse or endangerment. Following up hearings were scheduled for spring 2017 to review the Watchtower of Australia's policy changes and plans for corrective action, 2017. On March 10, 2017, the Commission held follow-up hearings to hear the Watchtower representatives' descriptions of any corrective actions taken by the Australian branch of Jehovah Witnesses over the past 18 months. More than five hours of sessions, the Commission was not satisfied and clearly disappointed with the testimony of, and voiced their displeasure with the efforts and official responses by the Watchtower branch representatives. Now that's serious. Um, you can follow this link if you want to hear the hearings. And I'm going to put these hearings up in this rerun of the Australian Royal Commission program. The scope and purpose of the hearings were to inquire into the experiences of survivors of child sexual abuse within the Jehovah Witness Church in Australia, the response of the Jehovah Witness Church and the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Australia Limited to allegations, reports or complaints of child sexual abuse within the church, the systems, policies and procedures in place within the church's Jehovah Witnesses Church and the Watchtower, Bi Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Australia Limited for raising and responding to allegations of or concerns about child sexual abuse within the church, and the systems, policies and procedures in place within the Jehovah Witness Church and the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Australia Limited to prevent child sexual abuse within the church. During and after the hearings, the Commission provided witness lists, transcripts, exhibits, images and associated submissions for each case study and makes them publicly available on the Commission's website. And you can go to that website yourself if you want the evidence. Submissions. After hearing the Council assisting the Royal Commission will provide witnesses and other people who were granted leave to appear at the hearing a written submission detailing what was discovered during the case study. The submission will outline key findings based on the hearing evidence and the recommendations likely to come from them. The recipients of the submission may then provide their own written submissions in reply. The commissioners then consider this information and when they form their final recommendations during the course of the Royal Commission. In the articles below you will find videos of the live streams of the public hearings and transcripts of those hearings and complete sets of the exhibits used by the Commission that were provided by those involved in the case. Many of these exhibits have never been publicly available before. And here's some of the, the stuff you can see. But I'm going to go now to live footage from the Australian Royal Commission on the Jehovah Witnesses, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, Church 
organization. I hope you enjoy this series. Mr Speaker, today as a nation, we confront our failure to listen, to believe and to provide justice. And again today we say sorry. To the children we failed, sorry. To the parents whose trust was betrayed and who have struggled to pick up the pieces, sorry. To the whistleblowers who we did not listen to, sorry. To the spouses, partners, wives, husbands, children who have dealt with the consequences of the abuse, cover-ups and obstruction, sorry. To generations past and present, sorry. We honour every survivor in this country. We love you, we hear you and we honour you. No matter if you are here at this meeting place or elsewhere, this apology is to you and for you. Your presence and participation makes tangible our work today and it gives strength to others who are yet to share what has happened in their world. And later, when the speeches are over and we stand in silence and we remember the victims who are not with us anymore, many too sadly, by their own hand. As a nation, we failed them, we forsook them, and that will always be our shame. This is apology is for them and their families too. Not just as a father, but as a prime minister, I am angry too at the calculating destruction of lives and the abuse of trust, including those who have abused the shield of faith and religion to hide their crimes, a shield that is supposed to protect the innocent, not the guilty, and they stand condemned. I simply say, I believe you. We believe you. Your country believes you. The Royal Commission and she's accompanied by her husband for support. It will be necessary for you to uh, take an, uh, to be sworn. You take an oath on the Bible or an affirmation? An oath on the Bible. The Bible. Now I think there's a Bible there, which is yes. a. Yeah. Can you take that in your hand, please, and stand, and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give in this royal commission. That the evidence I shall give in this royal commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Yes, thank you. Take a seat, please. Yes, Mr. Stewart. <clears throat> thank you, Your Honour. Do you have a copy of your statement dated 10 July 2015 with you? Yes. Are there any amendments or corrections you'd like to make to that statement? No. Can you confirm the statement? I tender the statement, Your Honour. Uh, it'll become Exhibit 29 one <coughs> I'd ask you, uh, BCB, um, to read your statement, perhaps commencing uh, at the third paragraph. My full name is BCB. I was born on Redacted 1967 and I'm 47 years old. I'm married to BCC and we have two daughters. My husband owns a Redacted business and I work for him keeping the books. I was formally baptised as a Jehovah's Witness when I was 18 years old. I grew up on a farm near Wikipen in Western Australia. I lived on the farm until I was around 19 with my dad, my mum and my younger brother. In 1977, when I was about 10 years old, my mum became a Jehovah's Witness. Between about 1977 and 1979, my mum used to take me and my brother with her to a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses meetings each week in Corrigan. Corrigan was about an hour's drive away from where we lived. <coughs> Mm -hmm. 
My dad and I were quite close up until I was about 10 years old. PCV, would you like Mr Stewart to read your statement, please? No, thank you. I should be all right. But, but if you, need, if you need a pause or you want Mr Stewart or your husband to help, then let me know. Okay. Just to adjourn for a minute? Just a minute. Thank okay, you. we'll adjourn very briefly. You let, you let us know when you're ready. Yep. But if you want your husband to read or Mr Stewart to read, that's quite appropriate. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a brief pause and come back when you're ready. All stand. My dad and I were quite close up until I was about 10 years old. However, when I started attending Jehovah's Witness meetings with my mum, we drifted apart emotionally. My dad wasn't a Jehovah's Witness and never attended Jehovah's Witness meetings with us. He never stopped my mum, my brother or me from attending Jehovah's Witness meetings. In or around 1979, my mum and dad decided that I should go to high school in Narragin. Narragin was about an hour's drive from where we lived. Because I was at school in Narragin, my mum decided to join the Narragin Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. My mum, brother and I attended meetings there every Wednesday, Friday and Sunday. The Sunday and Wednesday meetings of the Narragin Congregation were held at the Narragin Kingdom Hall and were attended by the whole congregation. At these meetings, one of the elders would usually deliver a public talk from the platform based on a reading from the Watchtower magazine or give a talk from the Bible. At these meetings, the elders would also lead question and answer sessions and give specific training about our door-to-door -door preaching. The Wednesday meeting was referred to as the Theocratic Ministry School and children were allowed to give talks about the Jehovah's Witness beliefs at this meeting. I remember that I sometimes gave talks at these meetings. The Friday meeting was re referred to as book study and usually took place at someone's house. This, at this meeting, a small group of families would come together to discuss biblical scripture. I first met Bill and Bronwyn Neal and their children at a large Jehovah's Witness party in or around 1979 when I was about 12 years old. Bill and Bronwyn had a daughter named BCE who was two years younger than me. BCE and I became very good friends. In around 1980, Bill Neal was one of two elders at the Narragin congregation. At the time, I understood that Bill's position as an elder gave him authority in the Jehovah's Witness community. He used to give talks at the weekly congregation meetings from the platform in the Kingdom Hall. The other elder in the Narragin congregation at the time was Jack Shaler. I looked up to Bill because he was an elder. Everybody in the congregation respected and trusted Bill, including my mum. Between about 1980 and 1986, I spent a lot of time with BCE at the Neal family house. I used to stay at BCE's house at least once a week. Often I would attend the Friday night book study meeting led by Bill at the Neal's house and then stay over at the Neal's house until the Sunday meeting at the Kingdom Hall. BCE mum, Bronwyn, or BCE's mum, Bronwyn, treated me like a daughter and I felt really close to her. I used to call Bill Uncle Bill. I recall that the Neal family talked a lot about church issues in the house. 
They used to discuss their belief in Jehovah. Bill in particular used to explain that all ideas and ways of behaving should be figured out according to what the Bible says. I remember that Bill would discourage BCE and me from forming friendships with other children who were not Jehovah's Witnesses at school. The Neil family always seemed to me to be an affectionate family, which I really liked. For example, everyone always kissed each other on the lips when they said goodnight or goodbye to one another. I remember that Bill and Bronwyn were very open with their kids about sex. Bill would often make sexual jokes in front of me. My mum never talked about anything to do with sex. I had grown up understanding that it was not something that you were supposed to talk about. In or around 1982, when I was about 14 years old, I was staying over at BCE's house as I did almost every week. I was having a shower and BCE, who I often shared the bathroom with, said, What's that on your tummy? I looked down and noticed I had a rash on my stomach. Despite me not wanting her to, BCE went and got her mum. I only had my knickers and a singlet on. Roman said she wanted to show Bill. I said I don't want him to see me. I never let my dad see me in my knickers, so I was really embarrassed. Bill came and looked at my stomach, and I remember feeling really uncomfortable about him seeing me like that. <coughs> Later in 1982, I was again staying over at BCE's house. On this night, as I was saying goodnight to Bill in the hallway of their house, he kissed me goodnight on the lips. Initially, this did not seem unusual to me, but he then stuck his tongue into my mouth. I pulled away and looked at him in shock. He looked at me and gave me a queer, smirk-type smile. I found myself half smiling back. I was so surprised by what he had done that I just froze. I didn't know what else to do. Every time I stayed at the Neil family house after that night, until the end of 1986, I had to endure Bill tongue kissing me goodnight. This often occurred in the hallway just outside BCE's bedroom. Apart from putting his tongue in my mouth when I stayed over at BCE's house, Bill's behaviour towards me did not seem to change. He continued to behave the same way around his family. He continued to lead the Jehovah's Witness meetings and to be respected by the rest of the congregation. Since nothing was said about what he was doing to me, I felt like I had to be, act like nothing was happening. I really didn't know what to do. I was scared and ashamed. I felt that I was somehow responsible for what Bill was doing to me. I felt like I couldn't say anything about it because I was worried that I would get into trouble and that Bill would belt me like he belted his kids when they were naughty. I respected Bill because he was an elder. He was also BCE's dad and the head of the Neil household. But I had also come to fear him. Because of his position as an elder, I felt that I couldn't tell anyone about what he was doing to me. I felt that if I told someone, it would upset Bronwyn and BCE, as well as the members of the congregation. Every time I thought about bringing what was happening to me out in the open, the consequences were too scary, so I stopped thinking about it. I felt like no one would believe me. A few months later, after Bill had once again come and kissed me goodnight at his house, BCE said to me, did my dad just kiss you for a long time? I assumed that BCE must have seen Bill kiss me. I was scared of getting into trouble, so I said to her, don't worry, it's okay. I thought at the time that by not telling BCE what was happening, I was protecting her. I thought that if she found out, it might cause her family to break up. I now wish I had told her. On one occasion, in or around 1983, Bill and I were out doing door-to-door -door preaching together. I remember that at some point, we were alone in Bill's combi van. Bill said to me, what shall we do about our little problem? I said to him, I don't know. Bill then asked me, do you want me to talk to Brother Shayla about it? You know if I do that, though, your mum and dad will find out. I replied no to Bill, because when he mentioned that my parents would find out, I got scared. I was surprised that Bill suggested speaking to Brother Shayla. At the time, I already felt guilty about what Bill was doing to me. 
But when Bill suggested speaking to Brother Shayla, it removed any doubt in my mind that what was happening between Bill and me was my fault. At the end of 1983, having completed year 10, I left high school. The following year, I studied a business course and in around April 1984, I got a job, redacted. I continued to stay at the Neil House regularly from around this time until the end of 1986. One night in or around 1984, when I was about 17, I stayed overnight at the Neil family house. While I was showering in the bathroom with the door locked, I heard a noise. I looked up and saw Bill perving on me over the top of the shower curtain. I guess he must have been standing on the basin to be able to see. I don't know how, but I assumed that Bill had unlocked the bathroom door from the outside. I screamed, get out, at Bill, and he left the room. Bill and I never spoke of the shower incident. On another night, also in 1984, and not long after the shower incident, I remember that Bill came into the BCE's room where she and I were making lots of noise and threw me over the bed. He started belting me across the buttocks with his belt. It really stung me and afterwards I had a dark red welt across my backside. Apart from the physical pain, I remember feeling humiliated, angry and shocked by, Will, by, by what Bill had done. On 26th of October 1985, I was formally baptised as a Jehovah's Witness in a ceremony that involved being submerged in a pool of water. At the baptism, many of the other girls wore modest swimming costumes with T-shirts over the top. I remember that Bill refused to let BCE or I wear T-shirts over the top of our swimming costumes. In or around 1985, when I was around 18, I noticed Bill's behaviour towards me became more sexual. He used to say things to me in front of his wife, Bronwyn, and in front of BCE, like, you're a nymphomaniac, and if you weren't in the truth, you'd be a prostitute. What he said didn't make sense to me, because I was a virgin. I recall that on one occasion, in or around the end of 1985, Bill Tung kissed me in this lounge room. As he was doing it, I heard Bronwyn say sharply, Bill, I remember thinking that we would be in trouble, but nothing more was said about the incident by Bronwyn or Bill. Up until the summer of 1985-86, I thought Bill's behaviour was just something unpleasant that I had to put up with so I could have a good time with BCE and the rest of the Neil family, who I liked. One day in the summer of 1985-86, while I was in the pantry in the kitchen of the Neil family house, Bill came in, shut the door and started kissing me. As I was older by then, I felt able to try and resist his kissing. Bill yelled at me and said to kiss him. He pushed me up against the wall and told me to pull my dress up so he could see my underwear. Thankfully, someone came into the kitchen at that, at that point and Bill stopped and left me alone in the pantry. In or around October 1986, I left my job, redacted, and I was very unhappy at the time because I was feeling pressured by people in the Narragin congregation to preach full time. After I left my job, redacted, I moved into the Neil's house for a couple of months while I was looking for a job for a new job in Narragin. BC was still living at home when I moved in with the Neil family. Bill continued to harass me while I lived at the Neil house. At the same time, he remained a respected elder in the congregation. I became really resentful of him. I stopped referring to him as Uncle Bill and instead referred to him as Bill. Looking back, I think this was my way of rebelling against him. One day, at the end of 1986, when I was 19, I had been having a shower in the family bathroom at the Neil's house. Although the rule in the Neil's house was not to lock the bathroom door, I used to lock the door because I wanted my privacy. That day, I had just stepped out, stepped out of the shower and was naked when the door suddenly opened and Bill walked in. I don't know how Bill unlocked the door. I guess that he may have unlocked it with a knife or even his fingernail. I know that Bill didn't walk in by accident because of the way he quickly opened the door, closed it again behind, me, behind him and stood against it, trapping me inside. 
Mill then told me, sit on, sit on the floor and open your legs. I didn't want to do what he was asking, but his manner was very threatening. I felt humiliated and scared. Angus, would you be able to read the next one? I felt humiliated and scared. Bill then started fondling me and put his finger in my vagina. He then told me to stand up and he proceeded to perform oral sex on me. I felt disgusted and uncomfortable. I knew that sex was something that people were meant to enjoy and I remember thinking that there must be something wrong with me because I didn't like what was happening. The next day I was lying in bed in my room feeling sick when Bill came into the room. He said to me, did you like it? I assumed he was referring to the bathroom incident. Pointing at his crotch, he said to me, it's better with this in. I asked him to leave and he did. Once he had left the room, I got up, packed my bags and went home to my parents' farm without saying goodbye to BCE. In or around early 1987, I remember telling BCE that I had been seeing a couple of boys. Not long after I told her that, BCE told me that Bill wanted to talk to me about my relationship with boys. She told me to meet Bill at the Neal family house. Even though the meeting was at his house, I understood that I was being asked to see Bill in his capacity as an elder and that I had to do as I was told. I would never have chosen to speak to Bill about my relationships with boys otherwise. When I got to his house, Bill asked me to wait in BCE's room. He came into the room and asked me, can, we, can you show me your boobs? Although I had come to expect this behavior from Bill, I remember feeling shocked that he was asking me this. I remember that I let him look down my top. I don't know why I did what he asked. Looking back, I feel as though he could control me. Bill then said to me something like, can you make yourself orgasm? I said yes, and he replied to me, I thought so, you dirty bitch. Bill was an elder for as long as I knew him. I wasn't able to see at the time, but everything he did to me was in complete disregard of all the Jehovah's Witness rules some of which he preached about sex and association between brothers and sisters. In 1989, I told my now husband, BCC, that Bill used to kiss me. I dreaded telling him, and I couldn't bring myself to tell him any more detail about what happened than this. When I told him, he started asking me questions about what exactly had happened, and I said to him, don't worry, it's all over now. I didn't want to say anything more because I was scared that BCC would tell someone. Later, in around 1991, a Jehovah's Witness acquaintance of mine, BCF, told me that she had been abused by her uncle and that she had tried to commit suicide. I told her what happened to me, but I didn't mention any names. Somehow she guessed that I was talking about Bill. I freaked out and asked her not to tell anyone. I guess that BCF did, did tell others in the congregation as a week or so later, a young elder from the congregation called Max Hawley came to speak to me. Initially, I had no idea why he'd come to see me, but he eventually revealed that he'd come to talk to me about Bill and me. When he said this, I burst into tears. I told Max about most of what Bill had done, but I couldn't mention the final bathroom incident when Bill had had oral sex with me. I was so ashamed. Max was very kind and supportive. He told me that what had happened was not my fault and that I shouldn't blame myself. Soon after, Max arranged a meeting with Bill, BCC and me at my house. I don't remember anyone explaining the purpose of the meeting to me. At that meeting, Max said to me, I, be I believe Bill asked you if you wanted to see his penis and you said no. I assumed that he was referring to the incident in the bedroom the morning after Bill had oral sex with me in the bathroom. Even though I had not told him about this incident myself.
Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment. If you watched it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one-off life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.